Oh, the blood of Jesus, it must not suffer long. Yeah. Hello, everybody. So, welcome to the Soul of the John Show. I'm here. It is the evening, weekend edition, afternoon edition. Baby. How y'all is? Come on in. Water. It, it's fine. It's, it's fine. It's always going to be fine over here. Let me uh, talk to you for a few minutes here. I want to talk about a wonderful question that came in uh, on the, the Google, well, no, on the Facebook spheres about the importance of a pastor. And it was a, it was a, it was a kind of a, a lengthy question, but the question pretty much is asking, do I need a pastor today uh, for my spiritual growth? Uh, good to see you, Amber, Lori, and Natasha Miles, and Lena, and Michael, Bourne, and Ty Tyrone, and Robin Ellis, and Ty Tammy, and Psalms, Tommy, and a whole bunch of y'all here, okay? And the rest of y'all are going to come later. Uh, the question is a good question, and I want to tackle this the best way I can without hurting hearts and offending too many of y'all, because everything I do will offend. Uh, blessings to you, Tommy. Wishing you a Merry Christmas as well. Everything that I do will offend. If I said Jesus is Lord, it's going to offend those over there who hate Jesus, who don't like Jesus, but may they 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 okay with him. But because I said it, they're going to say, well, I didn't say it like that, blah, blah, blah. And we tend to fight each other. It's inward fighting. This is friendly fire. And we're fighting each other over some of the most silliest things in the universe. And so let me see if I could fix uh, this answer here by reading an article possibly for some backup and strength so you don't think it's coming out of my head and I'm going to go to some of the text from some of the other writers uh, I have here an NIV NLT King James Version the Berean Bible uh, the um, New King James and uh, the Jewish Bible and uh, ESV I got all, all kind of uh, text over here uh, and uh, just so I can kind of give you some strength on this question here. I'll let the, I'll let the controversy begin. <laughs> yes, so the question is, do you need a pastor? My direct answer to you is no, you do not need a pastor. Now, is it good to have one? Yes. Is it good to have an attorney at law? Yes. When do you need him? When you need him. And you don't always need him when you need him, sometimes it's always, always good to just have him there. Deborah, it's always good to have an attorney at law, whether he's in your family or he's a dear friend or whether you just know of an attorney. It's always good. Even Jesus taught in the parables to get to know those people in the world. Get to know them. Have a good relationship with those people in the world, those who've got some type of persuasion influence over someone or, or or things, okay? Have some type of relationship with them because when you're in need, you can pull from them. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. So I have friends of those who are unbelievers, those who are not a part of the body of Christ. They are my friends. I know rich people. I know judges and lawyers, attorneys, or I know doctors. I have the business people, those out there who I am friends with, they don't come to church. They don't really really agree with what we do within the body of Christ. But they are uh, they we have a business relationship because when I'm in need, I pull in that help. And Jesus encouraged that. Uh, Jesus also had that that type of connection too with those in government. Good to see you, Tamara Miles. Uh, mm -hmm. So so you saying my pastor is a lawyer? <laughs> no, Tasha. No, absolutely not. No. And I, <laughs> and I wish the pastors would stop trying to be a lawyer and doctors. Uh, and some of them are horrible at counseling. They should, they should stick to what the calling was. Understand? Pastors have been given medical advice for people for too, many, too long. And pastors have killed people. They have, given, they have been impersonating uh, 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 doctors and, and nurses and lawyers. And they're given this type of, even especially financial advice, pastors have been giving financial advice to people and these pastors are poor. They, they don't even own their own homes. They, they don't even own their own cars. They, they have no assets. They have no stocks. They have no bonds, no no gold, no silver, no anything. Uh, good to see you, Wendy. And so they're giving advice to, their, to the flock. It's not their flock. To the flock. 
and and this, the flock is going away with this advice in in their hands and in their hearts and in their heads, and they and they're leaving uh, there and on their way to destruction, uh, and walking and on their way to bankruptcy court because pastors think that they could uh, give all advice. They are they are lording over the people with all this advice, and they are not qualified. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and we fall for it, Marcy says, all the time. So you got to stop this. Be careful, be careful. Your pastor is to stay in his or her lane. <laughs> oh, Tam Tamara, I was trying to tag you, and I think I tagged Tamara, uh, Tamara Lloyd. <laughs> so no, I think I tagged Lloyd, thinking I'm tagging you. And well, anyway, so uh, charge that to my fingers and not my heart. All right? So we we uh we need pastors when we need them. We need lawyers when we need them. All right now, some, some people are going to uh, not take this teaching very well, and I don't really care. I'm not going to go into 2020 leading you astray. I didn't I didn't bring you into 2019 leading you astray as well. The problem is we've been taught and trained and and, and believed that um, if you don't go to a church that you are you are sinning and you're going to hell uh, and that you can't be strengthened uh, in, in the Lord except you go to a house or a building where someone stands over you and that is not the case and that is a that's actually a very dangerous thing to do is to teach people that you can't find God except you go into a building where there is the where uh, the ecclesia gather and where there is a ministry of fivefold and many other folds that are there. The scriptures in Ephesians chapter four talks about something that I often re refer back to what Jesus did. Now, this is not Jesus speaking. This is Paul speaking, but he's telling you what Jesus did when he died on the cross before he ascended to his father, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. When he went down there, he led captivity captive, but he preached to the spirits that were chained in Sheol or Hades, or what y'all call hell, which is a mistranslation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There you go, <laughs> Natasha. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, Marcia says, Why do you think so many people are leaving the church? Because they're tired. For the same reason why people are divorcing so much, the number one reason for divorce is they're tired. It's not finance. It, it, we thought we always thought it was, but the, the second reason for divorce and separation is finance. But the first one is they're tired. They're tired of each other. They're bored with each other. They're always fighting, okay? When you're with someone all those years, all right, doing the same thing over and over again, and try, uh, 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 trying to share, in many cases, the reason why this is happening is because we were never prepared for this. Everyone is not born to marry, understand? And the scriptures uh, have, have, have actually caused more problems than it solved when Paul says that um, he said that it was, uh, my, I don't know why my iPad does this. He said that uh, he would that you be like him, single. He says, but because you can't contain yourself, flesh in the flesh, he says that it's better to marry than to burn with with passion, all right? And people start marrying because they couldn't burn, they couldn't stop burning in their flesh, and they got married. And then what happened? They didn't realize that they did not know how to share their life with other people. They could share their homes and cars and food and money, but they didn't know how to share their hearts fully. Instead, you're tested and tried in marriage. You, you're not tested as much when you're single. Even when you're shacking up, you can just walk away from that. But when you're married, now you become one with each other. Now I'm just trying to tell. Now your arm is having an argument with your eye. And uh, and y'all live together. And, and, and if you cut the hand off because the eye is offending you, as the scripture is saying, your body, your whole body begins to hurt. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Your whole body begins to hurt. Uh, the scripture calls problems for or the way the misuse scripture caused problems. Yes, Natasha, I mean, it's obvious what I meant there. <laughs> that scripture has caused problems. Every scripture in the Bible has caused problems. That's why we have 30,000 denominations, because the scriptures has caused problems. Well, you caused the problem. Yes, not you, Natasha, not you. you. <laughs> okay, so we're reading this and say, all men are supposed to get married. And Paul, the man who was writing this, wasn't even married. And... um. 
It, it, he, it, he should have been because he was part of the Sanhedrin. Hey, you know, that's the way it was with them. But he wasn't married. He told you that he wasn't. All right. Bless it to you, Charlie Milan. I love that brother. I was just thinking about you, man. Taco Tuesday. Uh, um, I've been missing that. Hello. <laughs> Hello. That's, that's Charlie's book right there. I'm looking at it right there. Charlie bought me this book, Christian uh, Counseling. It's right there. It's one of my favorites. It's over there. You see it right there over the corner, Charlie? I tell you, every time I read that book, I think about you. All right. Good to see you, Annette. Uh, it's the people. It's not the scripture. Exactly. All right. All right. So um, Jesus went down. He led captivity captive. Uh, and then up. He What did he do when he come up? He began to uh, present gifts unto men. Here's what it says here. But what does the what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to feel all things. And he himself. Now, different denomin uh, denomination, different translations say different things when it comes to what I'm getting ready to read. Bless you, Evangelist Robin. I will be replaying blessings. Good to good to see you. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm sitting next to your pastor, Michael's. My <laughs> yeah. All right. Now I choose to have a pastor. It's my choice to have a pastor. Now I'm also a pastor. I'm a pastor to many around the world. If you go on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, what have you, many people from around the world called me their pastor. I'm the only one that they know, many of them, who feed them the spiritual uh, food here. And they come to me, some come to me once a week, twice a week, and some come to me every single day. And they say, you fed me this week, and some will send me uh, uh, some all, an offering, and some people call it their tithe, and they will tithe to me. Yes, I'm uncomfortable with that, but I can't tell people what they shouldn't do when they want to just do whatever they want to do with their monies. All right, I'm, I'm not giving you a refund. <laughs> John the Williams, blessing to you. All right, and so they say from Bangladesh. I've got I've got them over in in, in the African nations. I have them in Canada. I've got them in in Israel. They they hit me up in uh, my inbox and in my messenger and on YouTube and say you are my pastor and you're the one that I trust with the word of God. And then and it's a big pressure on me. Yes. It's, it's, it's a huge weight and pressure on me. So that's why I always have to be in the word of God constantly so that I won't lead them astray. All right. But then what I do is when I do teach and preach these people out there that are part of the ecclesia, I lead them to Christ. I don't reject them. And when they say, when they say I'm, I'm their pastor, I don't reject any of that. God told me don't reject that. For I have placed you here, not in a traditional sense of being in a building, and I want to talk to you people out there who are uh, what they may call us Facebook pastors. A lot of the established pastors go on Facebook and they put in their posts and they put up these things about Facebook pastors and they try to make you look silly because you're not collecting a tithe and an offering out of a building. And these people who are talking about you, making you feel silly and insignificant, I need you to ignore them because they have a weight on them larger than you. And what is that weight? It's called more gosh. <laughs> okay. All right. They have a all, rather large mortgage on them if they haven't paid the church off. There are other things that come after you pay it off. Then there's other bigger, big, much bigger obligations. I don't want none of that. All right. So they got all they got the mortgage, but they even if they pay the church off, they still got to pay lights. All right. The utilities and and gas and and if a, if a plane come and, and hit the ceiling and they, they got to pay for that, they got to raise money for this and raise money for that. And that sounds nice and dandy. You know, when you look at these people who got the, the, whether it's the mega church or the mid sized church or what have you, these pastors are, um, are trying to make you feel like you insignificant because all you have is a phone or an iPad or, or whatever, and you are doing what you do. But I, uh, these people who are posting these these pastors who post this stuff, I laugh at them because many of them um, can't show you anyway. I don't want to. I just I don't want to go into the new year. Uh, with this friendly fire, 
but I will rebuke them when they try to make you feel significant because you have followers who are following your teaching, especially if you're leading the people to Christ and there's no scandal on your life, all right? And you're not sleeping with the missionaries or, or you're not sleeping with the, the soprano section or you're not it's misappropriation of funds and you're not doing all these things. You're just uh, doing what the commission of God has told you to do. So preach the gospel from your phone. Mm -hmm. Preach the gospel uh, from Facebook. Preach the gospel on Instagram and let them talk about you all they want to. Uh, but you don't have to stress. <laughs> Be stress free, okay? Preach the gospel. And the people are being uh, enlightened by the word of God. And then they're going forth. Uh, and they're spreading the gospel because what you're doing on social media. Ignore those men and those women who talk about you in their little posts. Uh, they, they, they are men pleasers of what they are, and they are haughty and full of pride, all right? And, you know, when I usually get through my show, a couple thousand have, have heard the gospel from what I have given on social media, and these other pastors out there who may have maybe 300 members, they happy with the 300 members, and the night before, I preached the gospel to 5,000 people, all right? I may never, ever meet them, but the gospel has been preached. So I don't care about these pastors with the three, four hundred, and five hundred members, and they try to, you know, I, I'm not trying to stand in a, in a uh, pulling on their coattails, trying to get in their pulpits to preach. I don't care if you ever give me the the sacred desk or the pulpit. I don't have to preach in your pulpit. I preach right here on social media, and around the world, the gospel is being preached. And people are turning, and atheists will be hitting me up and saying, man, you know, I, I, I hate your God, but there's something about the way you present this God that I may need to do some more study. There, there, are, uh, there are atheists who have turned from this devilish ways and turned over to God and says, you know what? I was wrong, Elder Jones. I was wrong because the way you presented the gospel to me, I get it now. All right? So uh, uh, away with that mess that I, I I read on social media. I don't I ignore the naysayers, all right? The preach who who tell the truth and preach the word are also the modern day corner preachers. Yes, with the bull horn. Come on, Charlie Milam. Yes. All right. All right. So that's what's going on here. No, I can't make it Tuesday. It's Christmas week, but oh, I'm gonna be hungry the week after. Um we talking about Taco Tuesday, by the way. Uh, their whole ministry is driven around the mortgage, Amber says, and the, the paying of the mortgage, the sustaining of the mortgage, and the political correctness of the bondage of the 501c3. They are under bondage, and they don't even know it. You don't, you don't even know it, all right? So, do you, or let me finish this, all right? So, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. All right. Now there's more to this. If you stop right here, then the answer is yes. Everybody need a pastor. Now, some of the translations say, and he gave some apostles and pastors, blah, blah. Then other translation says, and he, and he gave some to be. All right. Now, but what is the, the, the root here? What is it that Jesus did? He gave gifts. Now, what is a gift? Some gifts are absolutely vital to your, to your, your salvation and your, um, your being maintained. Some gifts. Other gifts are given, whether you get it or whether you don't, it's not conducive to your salvation. You can go on and live without these gifts, all right? The grace of God is extremely important for your uh, your livelihood, for your personhood. The uh, gift, the um, uh, grace, is a gift, all right. And this grace God has given to to all men, as He will. You understand, all right? Charlie says we need pastors, but we need those that are truly called according to the Word. All right, come on, y'all. Uh, Joy, good to see you. All right. So these gifts here. God gave to the world. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Ephesians chapter 4. He went down, he brought up gifts. These gifts were these people. All right? These are not offices. These are gifts. Notice that he never called it an office in Ephesians 4. He called it a gift 
and he gave these gifts, which were men, all right, mankind, all right, and he gave these people to the ecclesia. He sprinkled them. He said, some over here, some over here, some over here, okay, some over here. I give some, understand? So do everybody need a pastor according to what we're saying in Ephesians chapter 4? Do everybody need one? And if everybody need one but don't have a pastor, what's going to happen to these people who are saved? And I'm talking about sinners. I'm talking about saved folks. If these saved folks who are all over the world, they're in the darkest parts of Africa and they are on islands. They're in des destitute areas where there are no pastors. There's somewhere in, in a, a territories, uh, maybe they're somewhere they're saved, but they're in Russia. They're hiding in, 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 uh, in China somewhere in some cave. Uh, they're somewhere on the ice caps on the North Pole and there is no pastor. All right. What happens to these people? Hmm? And how do these people come to God? How did they get to God? Because they're, they're Christians or believers all over the world. They're in places you would not believe. All right. How did they get to become a part of the Ecclesia? Hmm? Hmm? Okay. The Bible says that man can't go to Christ except God draws them. God drew them. Now, once God drew them to Christ, the Holy Spirit keeps them. Mm -hmm. Keeps them. The word pastor means shepherd. Can we just have the Lord as a... <laughs> come on, come on. So the Holy Spirit keeps them. He is the governor of our lives. Understand, how do a government work and operate? Hmm? There are mayors, they are, they are, they are aldermen, they are governors, okay, and presidents, and all these other places. All these people strategically are put in place so that the government could work. You understand? Do I need a mayor in my life? Hmm. I'm messing up here. I'm messing up here. Let, let me finish reading this so that you can understand what I'm saying here. Antoine says, you don't need a pastor to become saved. However, I believe to a baby in Christ, a pastor is essential. Antoine, here I go. He says here, Ephesians 4. Because if you think that this is a teaching against pastors, why do I sit with one every Sunday? Hmm? Why would I sit with a pastor every Sunday if I'm speaking against pastors? Because I know that's what's going to happen after the show. They're going to, they're going to say, Ella Jones was speaking against pastors. But I sit with one every week. And I am a pastor. <laughs> okay? I believe that the definition of pastor changes. Truly, it is a miracle of how the gospel is pre presented to those people in isolated areas. Ain't that something? Hmm. All right. Well, let me let me see what it says here. He says, and he gave some. I'm right fivefold. Okay. Equipping, equipping the saints for the work of ministry. This is the purpose of the pastor. All right. Uh, amongst the other four, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Number one, to build up the body of Christ. Number thirteen. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. Uh oh. So it says we need these fivefold gifts until we reach something. What happens until? Uh, uh, what happens after the until? Huh? Can somebody help me? Because several pastors are here. What happened after the until? Can somebody tell me? Huh? Anybody? Mm. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by...
by Christ's a fullness, then we will no longer be children. Uh oh. Tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way unto him who is the head. And who is the head, he says here? Christ. Uh oh. Uh oh. From him, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love for the proper working of each individual individual part. Uh oh. I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> ooh, 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 I'm confused. Sharon, you on to something, Sharon. Come on, Sharon. Sharon, you on to something. Did y'all see her question? Um, Amber says, until we are matured, we are drawn by the unction of the Holy Spirit. We are governed by his word and guided by his ordinance. My grandson was just born, all right, a few weeks ago, and my grandson needs his mother. And she needs to be by his side as much as humanly possible. My grandson is constantly smelling and being uh, suckling and hearing the voice of its mother. And the boy is growing and maturing. And the time is going to come when that boy don't need his mother anymore. He's going to want the fellowship of his mother. But he won't need the mama anymore. No. No. Did I just confuse y'all today? Did I just confuse any of you today? All right? Hmm. Because what happens when a person is trying to mature? You're babes in Christ, and you're part of a ministry where the fivefold is there, and the pastor is instructing you like the word is telling you to do, and raising you up and equipping you until you are sent out to evangelize. What happens to those missionaries that travel around the world? Their pastor is not there anymore. So what happens? Antoine, that's exactly what you just said. So what happens when that person matures and they're gone? They're eating meat now. What happens to them? And what happens to the relationship with this pastor and that person? Does the pastor must travel with them wherever they go? Do they always have to call back to the States and ask the pastor for suggestions? Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. We all reach a level of maturity. Why don't people understand that elders will always make... Uh, and it went away. Where did it go? I'm going to take my Sunday afternoon nap now. <laughs> Not Natasha. She says she'll replay it. Uh, what do you say? Uh, well, uh, elders will always make themselves available. Yeah. Okay, now. Notice what he's saying here. He says, grow in every way until him who is the head. So the pastor's job is to raise up these babies. Help them to mature. Even send them out, Sharon Green, your question, to anoint them. Paul anointed Timothy, laid hands on him, put some oil on him, and he says, now listen, I'm not going to transfer my spirit into you. He, you can't do that. You can't tra transfer these 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 pastors are trying to make you call them your th this your they calling y'all their your spirit spiritual children. That's my daddy. That's my dad. No, that's not my dad. <laughs> not, that's that's not my dad. I called my uh, my former pastor. He's gone to be with the Lord, Bishop Moody. I called him dad not for spiritual reasons. I called him that for natural reasons because he acted and filled in. Uh, like my natural father did, he did. Uh, he did the same things my natural father did. So I call him Dad Moody for that reason only. I just upset it more of you, Sharon. What if the pastor says they didn't release you and try to stop you from moving forward? Now, Sharon Green, you're into a a 
an area right now that is so difficult among the saints. This is so hard right now, but I'm going to be bold enough to answer it. Y'all ready for this? Uh -huh. Antoine says there's also certain ordinances in of the church that a pastor or office of the church is there to perform. That is so true. I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, Joy, there is no spiritual father. That's what the Catholic believe. Yeah, exactly. So y'all be careful with the spiritual father stuff. Be careful. Be careful. Because when you lean on a spiritual father, then you begin to lean on this person for everything. Like the baby who's grown now and can't leave mama's house. Even nature understand the concept that the bird must leave the nest. And once the bird leaves the nest, in most cases, the bird never return to the same nest. Never return. He, will, he may never ever see his parents ever again. Because he's now going to be the parents. You understand? So when you're leaning on a spiritual father, he will always be that. And you will, you have to go to him for everything. What did you just do? You put up a veil in the house. All right. In the house of God. You put up a veil. And now between this man and God is the holy of holies. That's what you did. All right. So you can't go to God except you go to your spiritual father. And that could cause a problem in your life and in the life of your children and everybody else in your house that causes big problems. So, Sharon Green, to answer your question, the pastor can't lord over you. He can only give you advice. He can't tell you you can't go. But he can say, listen, it is not a good idea to go over there. You understand? If he said, I forbid you, then now he's lording over you. But if he says, that is not my advice as a, as a, as a man of God, and because the Holy Ghost it speaks through me, it is not my advice for you to go there. But hey, you can go. <laughs> you can go. I, I can't hold you up. That's between you and God. But I can't forbid you from going visiting that church. And that's what we come up under in Kojic, Apostolic. The, the whole Pentecostal movement was the pastor told you you couldn't go visit that church. You couldn't go over there to that concert. You couldn't go over there to that, that thing. All right? And, and y'all got scared. You didn't go. All right. And, and so that what did that do? That gave that pastor so much power over you, all of your mental decisions that you felt that you needed him or her for everything else in your life. Again, and y'all go to your pastor for medical advice and, and, and something as dangerous as medical and legal advice. You go to your pastor for all that, all right? And you got to be careful. Now, the, what you should go do is you should go to them and, and, and surround and have them to intercede with you in prayer. All right, and then if the Lord uh, gives advice, the Lord will also confirm it. But but we never wait for the confirmation. We we hear from the man of God, and then we go and do something strange. And men and women have died because we've gotten all this advice from the men and women of God, who we call pastors. And we have to be very careful. I've been under that spiritual father a dictatorship. Never again. <laughs> come on, come on. They teach that, and people won't search the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, well, you're about to lose some friends. <laughs> I already lost them when I said, hello, everybody. So on, this is so on, John Show. I lost some friends. Uh, I made a post about a bishop talking about spiritual fathers. He said, you carry their spirit and follow their faith. Ain't that something? Ain't that something, Tamara? Ain't that something? Ooh, I am just uh, logging on. Too many pastors try to make those who mature under their tutelage feel they are obligated to them. All right, this is Lashuna, who is a pastor. All right. When when uh, but when a pastor sees that their members is well able to go forth, they should encourage them to do so. This is a pastor talking, y'all. This is McPhee. This is my dear friend, and a pastor is speaking the truth here. Boy, I tell you, boy, this is I, this is good stuff. Mm -hmm. Making pastors your god. Yes, that's it. You gotta be careful. So the church belongs to who? This is the, this is the church of Jesus Christ, not of Latter Day Saints. <laughs> okay. My, uh, what are you saying? Am no, Antoine says my deceased pastor wouldn't, f wouldn't forbid us from going to certain churches. However, he would give a, a, a heads up as to, uh, what they believe and how it differs from our doctrine. Antoine, thank you. 
Thank you. That's exactly it. That's my whole point. Your pastor should be able to tell you, I've done the research and it is my professional advice. Like you go to your doctor and your lawyer for professional advice. Why would you be up in a, in a church upon their pastor and not receive spiritual advice? He should be tapped into world religions. And if he don't know nothing about Jehovah Witness, if he don't know anything, nothing about the church of, of Christ, okay, if you don't know anything about the Catholic Church, if you don't know nothing, nothing uh, 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 about the Mormons, all right? If you don't know nothing, nothing about world religions and many of the occults out there, especially, then why would you be serving with? Notice I keep saying with and not under. Y'all notice I've been saying that. Have y'all noticed that? I'm very careful by saying that. Sometimes I messed up and said I serve up under this man for so and so so. I don't believe in saying that. I used to say that a lot, but I have to, I have to catch myself. Uh, I serve this man. No, no, no. You don't serve your pastor. Your pastor is serving you. All right? So I messed up a few times and said, I served up under uh, uh, you know, Bishop Moody. I served that man. No, I didn't serve him. <laughs> I didn't. But when you're talking fast, you say that and then you have to catch yourself. No. They are the greatest servants. They are they are the greatest servants. They're supposed to serve you. <laughs> All right. That's why we should uh what verse ourselves on these different doctrines. Yes, yes, Tamara. I got two Tamaras. One is Tamara, one is Tamara. So y'all, 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 y'all should know this by now. I had a pastor tell me my blessings would only come to him. Oh, and he was my cousin. Yep. These 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 uh family churches are the worst though. These family churches where your uncle is the pastor, those are the worst. Man, there's so much witchcraft in those family churches. <laughs> when everybody's related to everybody, those are the worst. All right? Okay, all of them not bad, but too many of them are horrible. So much witchcraft. And you got to be careful to pull yourself away from because you feel like you you owe a debt of gratitude to because that's your family member. You got to be careful. And don't allow them to do so much for you to where they started pulling in the favors. Just because this pastor gave you money, helped you restore your lights and your gas, and maybe uh, saved your car from uh, being repoed or visited uh, somebody in your family or maybe did the uh, the obituary or the, or the eulogy for a family member. In your, so you feel indebted to that pastor for life. And I've seen people say, I'll never leave this church. This church have done this. I'll never tell a pastor, I ain't going to never leave you. I'll never tell a church, I ain't going to never leave this church. I'll never, till the day I die. And I've heard this all my life. That is, that is heresy. <laughs> Don't ever tell a church house that you'll never leave them because they did all these things for you. Never, ever do that. Never, never. Because once you do that, you can't walk it back. You can't walk it back. No, uh-uh, no. I'm happy where I serve in the Faith Temple Church of God in Christ. I'm happy to serve there. Wherever I find my hand to do, I do it. I do some deacon, deaconing. I do some musicianing. I do some eldering and ministering. Or I do some interceding and praying and giving offerings. I do all, all that in the in, within amongst the ecclesia. And when I don't feel like doing it, guess what? I don't do it. And when I don't feel like going, guess what? I don't go. <laughs> I've taken a few weeks off, and I now I, I was nice enough to say, "Listen, I'm not gonna be here for two weeks. Where are you going? You need to ask me where I'm going. I'm under no obligation here to tell you where. I'm do, out of the kindness of my heart. I'm telling you, I'm gone. I'm not gonna be here for two weeks. Now, we, you know, we we are the body of Christ, so I'm gonna be nice <laughs> and tell you, listen, I'm going out of town for a couple of weeks. Y'all hold down the fort, and I'll be back. It's just nice and decent and respectful to tell folks." I'm going to be gone. And I ain't got to tell you where I'm going. Okay, so once I got, once you tell me I need to tell you where I'm going, now you're putting me under a bondage that I will not be up under and uh, I'm going to have to leave here and there won't be no letter of resignation because it's not a job. These letters, y'all, y'all, these letters that y'all been trying to put the people on saying, you know, a person, person come to that church and say, you know, I want to be a member. And then you got to ask, where you come from? And they tell you where you come from. All right. Go back to your pastor. Tell him I need a letter. What? A letter? Why I need a letter? This ain't, this ain't, this ain't, this ain't a job. 
I, do I need a resume to come here? What? Now, I get the whole reason behind the letter, but the older I got and the more wiser I got, the more foolish I realized that that whole letter was. <laughs> foolish. I know what it's all about. You want to know where this person comes from. But if you got the Holy Ghost, show us some signs. If you think this person is dangerous and manipulative and what have you, you go to God. And, and bring them in, and you go to God and says, all right, God, give me what to do and say with this person here. And, and, and then the, the, the gift of discerning of spirits will operate in you and say, oh, I know who you are. Come out, devil. <laughs> Come out, devil. But because y'all don't have the spirit of God in you, you need a letter. Oh, man, I'm, I'm messed up. I wasn't supposed to do any of this. I'm Miles, you started this mess. I bet you you did. Brindick says, I knew of a church so devoted to the pastor that women could not get married at his church unless he had a, shall we say, private counseling with <laughs> Brindick. No, no. I got to learn to read Brindick stuff in my head first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. right. It, those were letters of good standing. A letter of good standing. That's what that was all about. We cre Who created this? God didn't create this stuff. God didn't ever create this stuff. Where do you see the letter in the scriptures? Where well, you needed a letter to go into a, a particular place, all right? The apostle Paul wrote letters to, to the churches, not because he wanted to join them, <laughs> okay? I don't, I don't understand that. I, I just don't. This is not how any of this works. Uh, the Lord has challenged me on, on many things, and I was, I was taught prior to pastoring that he would not allow me to do as a pastor, the Shunder says, we have been taught that pastors are the authority we should follow. I tell the members, uh, God have me leading to stop following me if I stop following Christ. Come on, girl. Come on. Now, it is our goal to point them back to Christ, and we should not make them feel bad about their needs. Uh, need to follow their God-given mandate because it is not tied to you as their pastor. Now, this is a pastor talking like this, y'all. And y'all pray for, the, put her name down in Lashuna McPhee. Y'all pray for her because what she just did just exposed the wisdom, but also the devil's going to try to come after her, y'all. Intercede for Lashuna M. McPhee. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Antoine says, if you're an employee of that church or have I... Uh, uh, obligated yourself to that church, it's in order to inform the leadership of your absence. Yes, if you're going to preach at another church using your church name, you may owe it to the pastor to let him know. Antoine, it's all right. So, notice what I said. All right? It is, it, it, if it's, and, and if notice what he says about, I think he, he talked about employment. If you're an employee, yes. Yes. Now, that's where the problem is. That's where the problem is. <clears throat> I don't know if I should deal with this part, this part right here. You an employee of the church on Sunday? Are you an employee of the church? That might be where the problem is. <laughs> that, that may, that may, okay. I don't know if I should do this. I, I, sh I should leave this alone. Should I stop, y'all? I think I should leave this alone because I'm already in deep doo-doo. Uh, um, Tam, what are you saying? Uh, because we are individuals collectively making up the body. Why are we not simply following Christ? Miles, I don't know. Why are we just following Christ? I don't know. Here's what it says here in this this this, this article here because I want, I want to tackle what Antoine just said, but it's just hard for me. <laughs> It's just, it's just, just hard for me. Yeah. So, out of the kindness of your heart, you should tell the the saints that you minister with. Listen, I won't be here for a couple of weeks. I won't be here for for a couple of weeks. I just, I just won't. Oh, thanks, L. Jones. Thank you for letting us know because we sure miss you when you're not here. I miss you too. I'm, I miss you too. I'll be back in a couple of weeks. All right, so we can continue. All right. So, if you have placed yourself in an obligatory old position in that church. That might be a problem. Okay, here it is. The word pastor comes from the Latin word, which means shepherd. Someone said it earlier here on the show. Now, the New Testament pre presents two offices that constitute church leadership. Elder 
overseer and deacon. All right? Notice what it said, office here. It is just respect to let them know. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just respect. Notice what I said. I let them know I'm not going to be here. All right? And if you want to take another week, let me, I, I can't mess with this. Eat the whole roll, <laughs> Ralter. <laughs> Bless the people. All right, so it says here, <laughs> Paul lists the qualifications for elder or overseer in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Then he said it again in Titus chapter 1. Notice that in the 1 Timothy passage, Paul refers to them as overseers, episcopos in the Greek. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Yes, Tamara, yes. And in Titus, he refers to them as elders, the presbytery in, in the Greek. Presbyteros, all right? That's what I am. I'm an elder of the church. I am of the presbyters. Understand? All right. From this, it can be concluded that there is one office with different designations. One office with different designations. The word elder refers to the life experience of that office holder. Life experience of that office holder. While the word overseer emphasizes the responsibility of the office holder. You understand? I'm an elder. That's my life. When I start doing stuff uh, over certain things... I have responsibility over certain things. Now I'm an overseer. The word bishop pops up uh, in the King James. And this is a supervisory uh, role uh, of hierarch hierarchy in the setup during the time of the text here. Okay. We have turned the word bishop to mean something else today than it meant when he wrote it. Okay. All right, Tamara, notice, notice I'm not calling these offices. <laughs> notice the beginning of my show. Remember I said pastor in Ephesians 4 is not an office? Remember I said that All right now. I'm reading someone else's mail. <laughs> be careful. All right, be careful. All right, so where am I? Uh, where, where am I? Where, where BI is? Uh, Bishop is a Roman governing office. Yes, yes. So... We have we have turned bishopric to mean something today that it didn't mean when King James sixteen eleven put that word there. Remember, I talked about the word church being added in in sixteen hundred. The old English term church that wasn't in Tinsdale. It well is right here, a uh, uh, Tyndale. Uh, Bible of 1524 church was not there it should says ecclesia which is a uh which is the the, the the called out ones or assembly or the congregation but that word church was added and invented later on well we got the problem here with bishop as opposed to uh this uh, overseer role it happened as well mm -hmm. okay Y'all understand what I'm saying? So when you're reading King James, we created some things that God didn't create, <laughs> okay? We're creating a hierarchy that really the the apostles didn't. They didn't create that, all right? There was a rule of government to set up that happened in the church to keep order. We changed the order, and we began to put words in there that... that means something today that it didn't mean back then. That's the big problem today in religion. The Bible calls deacon an office and it also calls bishop an office. All right. Let's go. Let's go in here. <laughs> let's go in here. Did God create the English language? Antoine said. <laughs> let's go in here, okay? Where am I? From this, it can be concluded that there is one office with different designations. The word elder refers to the life experience of the office holder, while the word overseer emphasizes the responsibility of the office holder to watch over the congregation and meet their spiritual needs. Okay, now, 
we're getting caught up in the word office and where did that word come from? Whose version are you reading? Understand, this English language can be jacked up. All right? N notice what I said in my, my, my teaching. I talked about the derivatives of words, etymology, and the English language comes more less less from Greek than it do from German or the Old Norse. So our language, over 85% of our language comes from German and not Greek. So what happened? Because it comes from German, oh man, some things changed. Even though the scriptures uh, was written in uh, Hebrew and translated, you know, into Greek and Jesus spoke Aramaic. All right. And so we have to be careful. So if we don't do some word searching. We're going to have a problem. Jesus still said that he gave gifts unto men. And these gifts were the people. They were not offices. They were gifts. Understand? So even if you're reading a word where you see Paul says he uses some words interchangeably. Did Paul use it interchangeably or did the translators of the scriptures use it interchangeably when he said we should not all sleep? But then he also used the word dead, the, the dead in Christ. But I thought we were asleep. Are we asleep or are we dead? <laughs> okay. And does it mean the same thing? So in walk these words that sometimes are used to mean the same thing. I, have I lost all of y'all today? Because this takes more than the, the little time that I have. And I hadn't had lunch yet, y'all. I just came home from church. <laughs> okay? Now I got a lot of my shows in 2020. I got to do this. Every, every other sentence. <laughs> okay? So the second office, I'm reading someone else's mail. All right? The second office is that of deacon. Mm. Yes. Uh, we have issues because... Folks just do what they want. Surface reading is dangerous. <laughs> okay. All right. The second office is that of deacon, which is described in Acts 6, 1 through 6. All right. All right. Let, let's see. Let's see if we can read it. Acts 6. Now, now y'all know. Man, this is, this is a problem. Antoine, are you still with me? You still with me, Antoine? Because you a deacon. You a deacon. And I know you're getting ready to defend this one. <laughs> You get ready to fit in this one. Oh man, Acts. Oh man, my Bible. Is, I got a new Bible, y'all. I told y'all about it, and um, I gotta learn how to read it because it's all over the place. Acts six. Okay, six one through six. Here it is. You, you, you good? Air quotes. Yes. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows are neglecting in the daily menstruation. All right. Hmm. Uh, then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. This is the presbyters, okay, saying, Listen, we we got to tend to spiritual matters and we, we're not trying to, it's like communion. We, we're not having communion so that y'all can eat and be filled. He says, If you're hungry, go home and eat. But this is not what, what this is for right now. So he says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Mm -hmm. But we will give ourselves continuing to prayer and to minister of the word and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, all right, and he talked about all the people that they chose, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples, it goes on and on, are these offices, Antoine? Hmm? Are these offices? All right, should I read another denomination? Uh, I keep saying denomination. Should I read another uh, translation? All right. What, what, were, these, were these deacons? And notice, 
It never said deacons in Acts chapter 6. We just assume that these are deacons. But that's not what it says here. Because in today's sense of the word, most of you deacons don't have the Holy Ghost. Y'all <laughs> a bunch of drunks. <laughs> All right, uh, Antoine says, I've been crowned a deacon and licensed a minister. That's right, you have. You, you sure have. All right, so um, is this an office? And are these deacons? Well, I'm going to say that they are, but the Bible didn't say that they were. But let's say that they are because the way it's spelled out, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an assumption that we could go by. Understand? But that's not what the Bible says. So if we want to read the scriptures word for word, line for line, precept upon precept, then I can't say emphatically that these are deacons because the door of deacon ain't in there. You see how the fight is? You see how we're so spilled over in controversy with the scriptures and why the atheists are, are winning? <laughs> the terrorists are winning. You see why they're winning? Because they're like, y'all don't even know your Bible. And you don't even know that that word not even in there. So where'd you come up with that word? Well, it is implied, all right? I implications are there all throughout. The word rapture is not nowhere in the scriptures, but we know what it means. It, it is implied. We, we know the definition of what a rapture is and what does it do. Understand? Dinosaur is not in the scriptures either, but there are dinosaurs in the text. I read it all through J J the book of Job. Well, I believe that that Leviathan is... Um, is a is a fire breathing dragon, all right. That thing is under the sea, and the, the Bible says man can't tame it. Man don't know what to do with it. And I believe that the eat the Asians got it right. That fire breathing dragon of the depiction we always see in in the in the depictions of China, China the Chinese and the Japanese and what have you, um, we we see that dragon. I believe they got it right. That's a dragon. The scriptures talk about dragons, all right? Dinosaurs. That's what that was. I believe the behemoth that we also see in, in Job 38, is it 38 or 40? I think it is. That behemoth, it talks about the tail. Like a cedar tree, it talks about its sinews. It talks about how it drinks water. It's like it, it drinks the whole sea. And, and the newer Bibles and the, those who are Darwinists, Darwin teachers or what have you, they tried to make you believe that that was not a dinosaur, but they want you to make, make you believe that it was a, 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 um, a hippopotamus. Or maybe a hippopotamus or what's that other thing, okay? It, 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 because they don't want you to ever let you... Anyway, that's another, that's another story. That's another story, all right? Because you got to be careful of the writers of the... Uh, so much evil happened in the old English uh, of times that the persuasion uh, and the influence of demonic uh, influence happened in, especially during the medieval time, that they begin to write in our text things that they try to lead you away from. Man, I'm, am I in trouble? I'm in so much trouble, I don't know what to do with myself. Trouble just, what lurks in the heart of man? The shadow knows. Yes, Leviathan, the sea monster. Come on, come on. So the the second office, the saying which is described in Acts chapter 6. All right, Paul outlines the qualifications of deacon in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and 8. The deacon's responsibility is to, is to minister to the physical needs of the congregation, freeing up the elders to concentrate on their spiritual needs. So Acts chapter 20 uh, and 28, Paul said to the Ephesian elders, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his blood. These are not your people. These are the people of God. This is not your church. This is God's church. Notice that Paul is telling the elders to be shepherds, functional role over the church. All right? For how long, though? Ephesians 4. Until. <laughs> I don't care. Are y'all getting this? Until what? The church is not a building a people, a movement. Buildings are a house for a group of believers who desire to, uh, to fellowship with each other. Uh, uh, Son Hunter, he's another Episcopal brother, a brother who's a part of the presbyter 
All right? He understands. He's a, uh, an anointing young minister of the gospel. They hear, y'all. They're here. So in Ephesians 4 and 11, Paul identifies shepherding pastors as one function in the church along with teaching because he says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and he says, and some pastors and teachers. He kind of put them together. And there's a fight, whether it's fourfold or fivefold, there's a big fight, right? Uh, missionary work, evangelism, and, and prophecy is separate. He says that this role is important, is seen by the emphasis that Jesus put on it in John 21 and 15, where Jesus charges Peter to feed and tend his sheep, not Peter's sheep, but Jesus' sheep. How is pastor shepherd supposed to feed and tend to the flock of God? He does this by being able to teach the flock the word of God. Man, I'm in trouble, y'all. Mm, mm -hmm. To bring the flock into maturity and to be restrained to heresy, he is on guard for false teachers and warns those who stray that there are consequences to their belief and behavior. He warns you. Put on the full armor of God. Be careful of the tricks and the wiles of the devil. That's the job of the pastor. Just like my daughter is raising my grandson, she is teaching and training and warning and correcting and chastising and all that stuff because the baby is helpless without the mama until the baby grows into his own where he don't need the mama to do that stuff anymore. That baby is now mature. Uh-huh. Y'all understand it. Are y'all understanding me or y'all upset with me? How many of y'all upset with me? Go ahead, tell me. Tell me you're upset. Go ahead. Uh, the problem is that people who hold these offices have not understood their roles and responsibilities. Therefore, things that come to the pastors that deacons should have handled yet. Yep, that's it. I'm agreeing with that. Now, we have to be careful not to put so much pressure on pastors. They're already pressured enough. Many of them are committing suicide. They're quitting their jobs. They're retiring. They're going away. <laughs> okay, they're tired. And some of them wanted to be pastors. All right. They wanted to be pastors. Some of them, many of them, God has never called them to that position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So I can't feel so bad for all pastors like I can't feel bad for the president of the United States when the Congress goes against him, when one of the branches go against him, where when the people uh, goes against him or when he's impeached. I can't feel sad or sorry or, or for a a, a, a um president because no one forced you to be the president. You spent millions of dollars uh, to become the, the president because you felt like you could change the world. In fact, you said that nobody can fix this but me. That came out of your mouth. So when something like that happens, don't be going on Twitter telling us and pray for me, y'all. Pray for me because, you know, they, they try to impeach me and they try to do this. I can't, I, I can't have too much sympathy over anybody who decide on their own they want to have a political, uh, be in a, a political position. I, I can't feel, I can't feel too sad for you. I mean, I, I'll pray for you, but I can't feel too sad because you wanted this, and you know that this comes with all kind of backlash and persecution. That office comes with huge persecution, right? So. Eat and be well. Uh, Paul says that you can what? Uh, I have to read on um, different apps here. Paul says that you can desire the office of, of the pastor. He sure did. He says, there it is. Antoine, he that desires the office of bishop, pastor, elder, overseer. That's what it's saying in First Timothy, okay? He desires a good thing. All right? If that's what you desire, <laughs> you desire... A good thing. <laughs> I'm glad you put that there, Antoine. We could deal with this. So I don't feel so bad for many of y'all who wanted to be in that position and, and you wasn't called. See, God calls. Again, he went down and he 
gave gifts unto men, and he called them. Many were called, few were chosen, and some of y'all just desired that office. I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm in trouble, man. I, I'm, I'm really am in trouble. Am I in trouble with y'all? Hmm? Can we make up? Pastoring is more than a notion. <laughs> yes. Uh, Tamara Miles, that that ain't in, that ain't in the Bible. I, what, what ain't in the Bible? I am the church. I I served at the local this congregation. Okay, and, uh, the young and the old are going out of here on, on here, y'all. <laughs> Uh, they didn't believe in Christ. Let let's not make excuses. God sustains His own. Yes. Um. So I don't want to leave this and leave y'all more confused. Okay, because many of you are saying you kind of getting it, but there's others out there who are still bathed in Christ who may not be getting what I'm saying. All right. All right. Let, let me fix it before I, before I go and eat. Okay, the best way I can. All right. Um, let me finish reading this one paragraph here. In the New Testament, the words pastor, elder, and overseer can be used interchangeably uh, with each word providing a different emphasis on what uh, contribution the leaders make to the body of Christ. All right? The three words come together in 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, touch not my anointing, do my prophets no harm, have been pulled and borrowed from the Old Testament and brought into the New. All right. And it has been used to further lord over the people and to use it as a, a, a whipping chain, more like it's really witchcraft and sorcery to bring that in to try to make you believe that that one man or that one woman that you call pastor is God's anointing and you can't speak against that person. Now, I need you to be very careful and you'd have to go back and research some of my shows that I did on the word anointed. Are you anointed? Go on YouTube and you can look at that show that I did. Are you anointed? You are anointed. Everybody who is a part of the body of Christ is anointed. You have an anointing on your life. All who are saved are anointed. Not just this person who's, who's God has given a, a charge, all right? Not just that person. All of you who are saved are anointed. So when anybody stand on the pulpit and say, touch not my anointing, you say, here. You see what I'm saying? Just say, here, all right? Because they do that, uh, to, to to block any attack that may come from the flock. Not realizing that the flock is just as anointed. <laughs> you are anointed. All of you. And look at the derivative, the, the root of the word, and what the word come from. All of you are. All right, now. It's just like how white evangelicals keep telling us, thank you, Tam, says, and there's only one anointing. That's it. One Lord. One baptism, one faith. Okay, there's there's only one. All right, one. It's not the offices of the church of particular anointing. Yes, it, it, we are anointed, whether it's particular or not. We're anointed. <laughs> okay. All right, yes. Yes, we're all anointed. Now, how we are anointed is a is an argument that we can we can go into part two with. All right? But I I'm the hand. You're not the hand, Antoine. You're the nose. Here's my anointing. It's particular. Your so-called office of the church is the nose, and you're particular. The hand can't smell. This hand can't smell nothing. You understand? And my nose can't pick up nothing, but it can pick up a scent. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's scripturally, it's scriptural bullying is what it is. Mm -hmm. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So, yes, everybody's anointed. White evangelicals, uh, are pushing uh, Donald Trump. Um, the reason why they love him so much is because he's doing his their bidding. All right, he's doing their bidding, and the bidding was, of course, this thing with the this whole thing with abortion, 
I'm, 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 I, I, I can get that. I can get with that. But then, then one of their main focuses is this whole thing with Israel. Remember when he said he was going to move the, 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 uh, what do you call it? What do you call the, uh, the, the, the embassy, right? He's going to move the embassy back to him and, and the white evangelicals went crazy. Uh, the problem, and I said this in my last show, and I and I peed off some Israelites, and I don't care. The problem that I'm finding here is that we seem to separate the call or the anointing that God has put over us individuals, which we seem to tend to separate this. You're greater than he is. You're more anointing, anointed than he is. You understand? And we do this in our churches. This person comes and sings over y'all. Y'all bring in these recording artists and to, and pack the house out because this person got a few records out there that y'all love their songs. And they, they have the, the gift to do vocal catastatics. Okay? And they, all these things. So you say that they are highly anointed as if your musicians who play at your church every Sunday are not anointed. Bring him in because he's anointed. And, but yet you, these people singing in your choir, this soprano over here, way in the back, is just as anointed as this person you're getting ready to give $10,000 to to come sing two songs. That soprano over there that you're ignoring is just as anointed. And this is what's happening in our churches. We, we get so caught up in the sound we think that there's the sound of anointing. There's a sound of anointing. Mm -hmm. But when you go to other cultures, who they're saved, but when you go to their culture, you say, ooh, what is this? Ooh, ooh. It's because you're used to your sound, and you're not used to their sound, and their sound sound like, if you ever go to an African church and hear their music and see how they dance, you think they're devils. <laughs> You go to a Jamaican church, whoa, what's all this gyrating going on? They are anointed. That is their culture. That's how they worship. When you go to a little country bumpkin church down in Alabama where there's a white uh, church with a little steeple on the top and they're, they're praising God on the, on, the, on the one and the three, okay? And they're doing this. Ha, ha, ha. They are anointed. That's their sound. And you bring your, your sound in that church and playing all those jazzy, cozy chords, they can be like, oh my God, what is that? That is not of God. That is not God. That is not. So they think that you're not anointed because you're bringing all that jazzy sound in there. You see, what, you see what's happening here? These cultures worship God in their own way. They are all anointed to worship God the way God created them to worship. I cre I worship Him on the two and the four, with a with a with the jazzy upbeat. All right, and she worship Him in the one and the three with a folklore downbeat. It's all cultural, and when we all get to heaven, it ain't gonna just be cultics up there, apostolics up there. The book of Revelation talks about all. Oh, I saw a number that no man could number. All race and creed and people and cultures and all all these people in heaven, all right, praising God in their various different ways that they worship God. So you're so stuck and caught up on the way you worship God that you have called. That's why your churches are so segregated because it is it is a strange fruit. Some people coming in with different a different way. A Japanese church came to our church a couple of years ago and they came there and they sat in the audience and they sat still and they didn't move during our whole worship. They just sat there. They just sat there and just watched us. And then we called for them. All right, we're going to call for the Japanese congregation of the foreign affairs choir. I don't know. And they came up, grabbed the mic. Now, they couldn't Speak. They didn't speak English. At least it wasn't that great. It was so broken. We needed an interpreter. But when they got on the microphone and they got on the instruments and what have you, they sounded just like us. They had every move. 
They did that. They said, glory, hallelujah, in, in our English. <laughs> I think they said a bunch of, uh, a couple of shandals in there. Okay, they, they, they did all of the things that we did. Okay. Get on your feet, everybody. Let's praise God in this house. Hello, walls. They were using all of our cliches. And when they got through, they went back to being stone faced. I realized what they were doing. They, they were studying our culture. Because a couple of them had looked, oh, that, oh, you say that right. Once he says that, they, okay. and they studied us so well that they had us down pat. When they went back to their uh, Asian church, I bet you it didn't sound nothing like us. Do y'all understand how this this causes? A, I, I don't get it. Say it. People think if she or she can't do those runs, they are not anointed. It's a shame. Black music is America's number one export. Come on, Britney. <laughs> I love the way you said that. Yes. Yes. That's good. Antoine. What where Antoine is going? What is what's going on here? Did I miss something? Y'all saying, yo, what y'all saying about Antoine? Uh, he said something. Somebody said uh, safe safe travels. Where he going? Okay. Oh, Antoine saying that to Ant. Wait, it's two Antoines. I don't know what's going on. Uh, we all have our parts to bring, which makes for a beautiful uplifting unto the Lord, a beautiful unified anointing. Come on, Rev Rev Tom. I'm so glad you're here. Hey y'all, that's Rev. Vonnie Smith. I, I, I love it because that's Lonnie Smith's daughter right there. That, that's Lonnie Smith's daughter. Y'all know who Lonnie Smith is. You know, he wears that. What do you call that thing? He wore that, that, that rap. <laughs> okay? And he's known as the greatest jazz Hammond B. organ player in the world. Yeah. Lonnie Smith. The great Lonnie Smith. I carried a lot of my style after him. Well, that's his daughter right there. She's back on Facebook. She's a reverend. She's a preacher of the gospel. And she's my dear, dear friend. Yes. Um, so, where where we at? But when you visit them, they sound nothing like us. Exactly. So, they call those people over there Israelites. Turban. Thank you, Rev. Yeah, he wears a turban. <laughs> Is your daddy still wearing that turban? Uh, oh, you're talking to Eric. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Antoine said, mind your business. <laughs> All right, y'all pray for Eric. He lost his brother a couple, a couple of days ago. Let's pray for him. Um, what's he ready to say? Oh, white evangelicals thinks that Donald Trump has given them all the things that they need him to do. And they one of the, the, the scriptures talked about be a blessing. Bless God told him that if you bless uh, Israel, I'll bless you. If you curse Israel, I'll curse you. But we were grafted in. So why are you leaving America and trying to bless Israel over there in what y'all call the Middle East? We're grafted in. Yet you leave us to our struggles and problems and and suppressions and and brutality and all these things. And we're grafted in, but you rather leave the family and go over there and help them out because you're afraid of what the scripture is saying about blessing Israel. And those the Zionists over there, we don't even know who they are. <coughs> I'm in trouble. So. You support everything that those people over there in Jerusalem are doing. Even if they're sinning, you support them. And they are bigots. They don't even like black people. They hate black people. They hate them. So support everything that they do because God says bless them. Did he say bless their sins? That's where the problem is. We can't read. Evangelicals hate Jews over there, over here, but bless Israel overseas. They hate the ones who, the yamaka, hamaka, yak, yak. <laughs> okay, you see what I'm saying? They hate them over here, but they love them over there. They travel, these white evangelicals go over there all the time. They're over there with those tours. Every time you turn around, I'm in the land of Israel. Here's where Jesus uh, spit in the man's eye. Right over here in the corner, all right? The corner of Fifth and Mahachanek, all right? Right there, all right? And they over there, and they come over here, 
and act a darn fool among us who are grafted in. I'm trying to tell y'all, this is some of the most hip, hip, the hypocritical people I know are those who call themselves Christians. And God must judge. So, if you are a pastor of a church, I, I'm asking you to continue to feed the flock. <clears throat> feed them the word of God. Don't feed them you. All right? And if they want to give to you, that's fine. The Bible says to muzzle not the ox which treaded out the corn. And it's not just exclusively talking about pastors. All right? It's all these people who work in the ministry. Take care of them, if you will, if you want to. It's, it's a good thing to do that so they can continue to feed the flock. All right? Go ahead. Give them. Give them money. Give them food. Uh, give, give, give them housing. Some churches are doing that. All right? Supply them with whatever they need. If they continue to bless you, go ahead and bless them back. God says you can do that. It's okay. All right? It's not an order. You're not going to hell because you ain't doing it. But it is a good practice to do that. Bless them so they can continue to, to feed you and and the children and then when these children come to a maturity in God then they go out there and they witness to others they go out there and spread the gospel all right they'll thank you for it but release them and let them evangelize and do missionary work wherever they go and if they choose to continue to have a pastor by their side to continue to feed them the word of God leave them alone Y'all stop fighting with people who are still part of a body of Christ. Y'all stop fighting them. Mm -hmm. White boy teaching henceforth coming. <laughs> <And Brazil. laughs> it is coming. It is coming. Leave these pastors who are doing a good work. Leave them alone. Let them continue to lead the people to Christ. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all leave them alone. And if the ecclesia wants to meet in, in a building, let them meet in the building. Where else they're going to meet? Let them meet in there. It would be good that they would build buildings uh, and pay cash for them and build them from the ground. That would be great to do. Uh, but the Ecclesia is not together like that anymore, like they were in the first century church who had all things common. They didn't have to go to the world for nothing. They didn't need you no know, bank loans and mortgages and all these things. They didn't need that from the world. They had everything within themselves, like Black Wall Street didn't need to go outside to white folks to get anything. They didn't need to do that. You understand what I'm saying? They didn't need that. Uh, my grandparents, when they went to see a doctor, they went to see a black doctor. When they needed a legal advice, they went to see a black lawyer, my grandparents. When they wanted to go shopping, they went to their own store. My family in, in Mississippi, Canton, Mississippi, went we had our own store the people of the town went to the jones family store for their fresh fruits and vegetables and when they needed to gas up their uh their volkswagen beetles that's what we had we had a gas station on the corner it was the jones gas station and they gassed up at our gas station you understand what i'm saying so blacks did not have to go outside of their communities for nothing other than to pay their taxes. They had to go down to City Hall. They didn't need anything. So um, you go to Atlanta or up and down Auburn Street where Martin Luther King's father lived. Those were wealthy African Americans. They, those were their homes that they owned and they had their own stores. and They had everything that they needed. That's the way it was. What happened? You walk up and down your neighborhood right now, and it, everybody got a business but you. I'm here in my neighborhood right now, up in the Roseland area, uh, up and down from uh, 111th in Michigan to 119th in Michigan, there are no black establishments. None. There was one black bank. It's called uh, Seaway National Bank. And it's no more. It has been bought by a, a a company down from Austin, Texas or somewhere. No more. That was the last we had. So every store from 111th to 119th 
is Asian. Well, both, all Asian, meaning I'm talking uh, the Asian with the dots on the head and the Asian who make you a nice bowl of uh, sh shrimp fried rice, <laughs> okay? I was, trying to, I was trying to back that up so I wouldn't be, I didn't want to sound racist, so I had to be careful, all right? And then Hispanics, that's it. There are no African-American shops nowhere up and down that strip, nowhere. What happened? All right? What happened? Today, our own communities are, t are taking us out. I go to the black-owned store to buy stuff. I have to walk through a cloud of weed and dodging a fight. Dimone? I like to go to concerts. Whether it's a jazz concert, you know. I don't really go to blues concerts, okay? But if I wanted to, that's fine. I, I, you can send me to hell later, okay? But the last jazz concert I went to, I walked in that place. It was packed. A couple thousand people were in there. And it was 99.99% white. When I went to the last blues concert, whether it was outside or inside, it was 99.99% white. Why? Because we have abandoned everything. We've abandoned everything. Our culture, our music, our food, everything. We, once we got a right, we had a right to, was that what they call it? Segregation, desegregation. Once we realized that we can drink from the same faucet as a white person, we began to want everything the white man was, and then what we did, we wanted their culture, we wanted their clothes, we wanted their food, we wanted their music, we wanted everything. And we and we left mom and pop to fend for him or herself there. And they struggled as hard and as long as they could, and then Walmart came to town. And what did we do? We passed by mom and pop. Hey, mom and pop, y'all doing all right? Okay, good. I'm on my way to Walmart to buy a vacuum cleaner. I'm on my way to Walmart because they're fresh. They, their fruits and vegetables are a little fresher than yours. <laughs> it costs. I can get this. Uh, this. The, I can get it for fifty cent a pound instead of a dollar pound. Buy mom and pop, and then mom and and pop close their store. Now what you getting ready to do? Where's mom and pop? Oh, they closed down. See, we can't. Have nothing in our neighborhood. Every time you turn around, mom and pop is closed. It don't make no sense. You can get you a picket sign. Uh, open mom and pops. Open mom and pops. Open mom and pops. And you never shopped at mom and pops. Yeah. My dad's concert. He did here in uh, uh, PH, PGH. 95% white. I know. I know, Smith. I know. I know. Whenever I see your dad in concert anywhere, you look in the audience. It's white. We walked away from it. If it ain't pop, that putain <laughs> and denigrating women and pushing violence, then we ain't interested. Yeah. Marcellus gave a free concert at Yale. Belinda, if they find out that Marcellus Winton is coming to town. Eight months from now, the white folks will buy those tickets and sell out. I can't get in there. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell y'all. The blues, we, 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 we have a way. Jazz, we have a way. Gospel, the leading show is owned by a white man who is blatant in his disrespect and disregard for black. Come on, I know, Demone. Mm -hmm. There is the hatred among blacks on each other. Yes. Um, uh, my great grandfather had a mom and pop store. You tell the truth. Come on, Joy. Uh, Amber says, if Walmart didn't get them, then the government's uh, eminent domain. Yep. Now swept up the land right from under us. Yep. There it is. There it is. We walked away from it. And then... Who do we run to? What's the girl's name who's the real big girl who's 
Every time you see her show on TV, she, she's pulling off her clothes. She was on SNL last night with, with Eddie Murphy. What's the girl's name? Colorism among us is still still exists. Yeah, I gotta eat. Uh, what what? How long I been on here, Amber? You the you the clock keeper. Um. Um. Lizzo. Thank you, Lizzo. Lizzo had her clothes on last night. To a certain extent. You can still see all her glory. And then her dancers in the background were showing their glory. And that's what they think of you. Mm -hmm. Abronia said, now you know why I didn't show up. Yeah, <laughs> I was with my dad, Abronia. Uh, that's why I didn't show up today. I know he's with you now, but I was with him earlier, so I, I had my time with Pops. And it felt good to be with my Papa. And my daughter was there, too. I didn't know she was going to be there. I walked in there with my daughter. Hey, hey. Uh, it's good to be with my dad. Let's see. Hit, hit that. <laughs> take all my money. Just take all my money. I just want to bless you. And blacks cry that we have no good concerts or plays coming to our town. It is because we will not spend the money and support. You see? That's what, yeah, yeah, we, <laughs> we've lost respect. All right, I got to go. I've been on here for an hour and 30 minutes, a little long. Uh, that's, that's a usual so Walter Jones show, <laughs> but it's still long, too long. Listen, uh, can y'all, you know, pray for me? Um... I'm really going through. Uh, I'm staying strong in front of y'all, but it gets it gets rough. People are just keep dying, dying in my life, keep dying in my life. Um, some of you don't know, and I'll put a post up maybe tonight. I uh, gave my I donated my kidney to a young man. Well, he's older than me. Uh, he's he's probably he, I don't know how old is he now. I guess when I um, eleven years ago. I donated my kidney. I didn't know him, but the Lord linked us up, and God told me to do that. And I did uh, in uh, 2018, and I suffered greatly. Pain. Oh, the pain was amazing. I, I didn't realize that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll talk about that at another time. But he was getting ready to die, uh, and I gave him my kidney, and the Lord blessed him. Uh, to not only live, but he also changed his career. He became he was a he was an an accountant, but he became a nurse after the surgery. He decided to change his career because he said he wanted to give life like I gave to him. And I told him, I didn't give you life. God did that. He used me as a vessel. Are you listening, pastors? He used me as a vessel. <clears throat> um, and then um, uh, his mother called me a couple of days ago and said that he died. And my heart. Did I say 2018? I'm sorry. 2008. Thank you. 2008. That's the same year that my mother told all of us that she had cancer. So I gave my kidney, and then I'm hearing my mother tell us he had cancer. And so both of him and my mother lived for 11 years, and they both died just a few weeks apart from each other. Um, that's tough. That's tough. Those who you think are going to be here forever, they're just... But the scripture says life is but a vapor or a mist. You're here today, not gone tomorrow, but you're here today and gone today. And I heard God tell me that you are getting ready to do a eulogy for someone very special. And he gave me the sermon notes and everything in my head. I was in Atlanta visiting my 
grandson, and he showed me a lot of people. And I was dry, I was riding in the car, and he showed me people. As we turned the street, he showed me people. And God told me, each one of those people is a movie. What you're seeing before your eyes are different movies with different plots. I'm like, why am I seeing this? And he says, get ready, because you're going to do a eulogy for someone special. I had no idea. So he died, and when his mother called, uh, she told me that I need you to do the, the eulogy for Cedric is his name, spelt Cedric. And I told her I'm, I would be honored. And so the funeral is this Friday, uh, here, in, not here, but in Gary, Indiana, so uh, pray for me because that's a tough one. That was my brother. And I would call him periodically. I would go visit him and have dinner with he and his parents. And we laugh. Um, and I preached the gospel to him. What decision God made, I don't know. But I preached the gospel to him before the surgery and after the surgery. All right, y'all. This is my mommy. She's always watching. That's my mommy. Evelyn Jones, the greatest woman I know. She's with the Lord right now. Hey, uh, Alexa, say good night. Good night. Sleep tight. I see Kista Lynn Patterson here. I don't know if she's here or not. You know, people pop up and say they're watching and then they go they go somewhere else but it'll say that they're still watching but they ain't, they ain't there <laughs> they ain't there Kister Lynn Patterson was my mom's close 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 friends they were they were tight as thieves I see you I see you and I love you alright gotta go y'all gotta get something to eat continue to pray for us as I pray for you uh, continue to do the work of the Lord and don't let anybody tell you that you're insignificant. Continue to preach on social media. All right? Continue to do that. And don't just not do it. Just do it here. But go into the streets, highways and byways, especially on your job and in your community. It's okay. You don't have to bring your Bible everywhere you go and pound it on people's face. That the life that you live, though, the people can see the change, the difference in you. And they're going to want to know what is it that you're doing. Why you look the way you look. Sherry Hagley, blessings to you. Thank you. I love you, girl. They're going to ask you, what is it about you? <clears throat> when I walk up and down the grocery store aisles, all right, and they, they sometimes come up to me and say, and I ain't dressed like this. I'm dressed like y'all, plain clothes. And they say, who are you? Are you a preacher? Are you, there's, something, there's something about you, all right? These are people, they always they approach me. There's something different. You should walk a certain way. You should be able to talk to uh, the meat man a certain way. And the meat man said, you're not like regular customers. What is it about you? All right? So that's how you preach the gospel. It's in your walk. And you're on the airplane, 30,000 feet in the air. All right? And you're having a conversation. They can tell that you're not laughing at their nasty, dirty, undressing women jokes. When they see I'm not laughing... Then they change the content. They say, oh, he not about that. And then I push the conversation a certain way. I don't say, loose here, you're going to hell. That's nasty. No, I, I take him another place because God has given us strategies, wittiness. All right? And I take him in a witty position. And they're like, oh, 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 yeah, 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 you're right. You, you're right. And then when they realize who you are, then they'll start saying, my grandmother taught me how to pray. <laughs> I got to go, y'all. Hit the share button, will you please? The Sir Walter J. Sir Walter J is the cash app. It's Christmas and everybody's coming after me. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Love you.